In the serene and picturesque town of Keddie, California, nestled deep in the Sierra Nevada mountains, a sinister darkness once descended, shattering the tranquility of this idyllic community. It was a shocking morning in April 1981 when a 14-year-old girl named Sheila Sharp stumbled upon a scene that would haunt her for a lifetime. Inside a seemingly ordinary cabin, a nightmare had unfolded. A brutal and merciless massacre that would leave three lives extinguished and one young girl missing. As the sun rose that fateful day, it cast its rays upon a trail of secrets, mysteries, and unresolved questions. What could drive someone to commit such heinous acts of violence? And why had the authorities struggled for decades to unmask the truth? Join us on a chilling journey into the heart of the Keddie murders, a haunting mystery that has confounded investigators, stirred rumors of conspiracies, and left an indelible mark on the annals of American crime. The Massacre at Cabin 28, The Unsolved Keddie Cabin Murders The year was 1979, and Glenna Sue Sharp found herself at a crossroads that demanded unwavering strength and a desperate escape. Born on March 29, 1945, Sue had already faced her share of hardships before the events that would propel her into the annals of a haunting mystery. A resident of Springfield, Massachusetts, Sue's early life was marked by aspirations, dreams, and the promise of a better future. However, as fate would have it, Sue's journey took an unexpected and dark turn. It was in Connecticut that she encountered the man who would become her husband, James Sharp. Their initial connection was tinged with hope, but over time a different reality emerged, one allegedly marred by abuse, turmoil, and fear. Determined to reclaim her life and provide a safe haven for her five children, Sue made the courageous decision to break free from the chains of her marriage. In 1979, she embarked on a journey to Quincy, California, seeking refuge in the embrace of a new beginning. Alongside her children, John, Sheila, Tina, Rick, and Greg, Sue left behind the darkness of her past in pursuit of a brighter future. The vast expanse of California's landscapes held the promise of hope and healing for Sue and her children. With a fierce determination to rebuild their lives, Sue enrolled in typewriting classes, a small but crucial step toward achieving financial independence. Through sheer grit and resilience, she secured part-time employment at the Quincy Elks Lodge, further contributing to her vision of self-sufficiency. Despite the scars of the past, Sue's spirit remained unbroken, and she focused on nurturing a sense of normalcy and stability for her children. It was in this context that the family's path converged with the Keddie Resort, a seemingly picturesque haven nestled in the serene landscapes of Quincy, California. Little did they know that this seemingly idyllic setting would soon become the backdrop for a night of terror that would shatter their newfound tranquility. In the seemingly innocuous act of moving into Cabin 28, the Sharp family unknowingly set the stage for a mystery that would perplex investigators, haunt a community, and defy resolution for decades to come. The safety they sought in their new surroundings was abruptly stripped away on the night of April 11, 1981, as unfathomable violence and darkness descended upon their lives. The night before, on the bright morning of April 11, 1981, the Sharp family's day began like any other. Around 11.30 a.m., Sue, Sheila, and Greg embarked on a journey to collect young Rick who had a baseball tryout scheduled at Gansner Field in Quincy. As they journeyed through the picturesque landscape, their path unexpectedly intersected with John, Sue's eldest son, and his friend Dana Hall Wingate who were found hitchhiking at the canyon's entrance, a passage leading from Quincy to the serene hamlet of Ketty. Without hesitation, they offered the two hitchhikers a ride, and the journey stretched for about six miles, drawing them closer to Ketty's heart. But approximately two hours later, John and Dana decided to hitchhike back to Quincy. Observant eyes spotted the two teenagers in Quincy's bustling downtown area, blending into the tapestry of daily life before they attended a party with friends later that evening. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Casting long shadows over Ketty, Sheila headed over to their neighbor's house in cabin number 27, planning to spend the night with the Seabolt family. With Sue remaining at home, tending to Rick, Greg, and their young friend Justin Smart, the stage was now set for the night's events, though no one could have foreseen the horrors that lay in wait. Also over at the Seabolt's house watching TV, Tina was soon told to return home by 10 p.m. at their mother's request, leaving only Sheila absent from cabin number 28 as John and Dana hitchhiked their way home after their party. As night turned to morning, all seemed perfectly normal, but this could not have been further from the truth. The Discovery As dawn broke on April 12, 1981, the tranquil stillness of the morning in Keddie, California was shattered by the events that would etch themselves into the collective memory of the town, a memory tainted by the unfathomable horror that unfolded within the walls of Cabin 28. Sheila Sharp, only 14 years old, returned to her family's cabin to discover a nightmare beyond imagination. As she entered Cabin 28, 
Sheila's eyes bore witness to a chilling tableau that defied comprehension. A living room transformed into a scene of carnage. There before her lay the lifeless bodies of her own mother, Sue Sharp, her beloved brother John, and his friend Dana. The very air seemed heavy with the weight of terror, and the room bore the gruesome evidence of a merciless struggle. The victims had been subjected to a violence beyond imagination, bound, gagged, and attacked with a ferocity that told of an unspeakable malevolence. The walls themselves seemed to bear witness, splattered with blood that bore testimony to a desperate struggle for survival. Knives and a hammer, the instruments of violence, lay scattered on the floor. Tina Sharp, the younger 12-year-old daughter of the family, was conspicuously absent from the horrifying scene. A haunting void replaced her presence, leaving a question mark in the midst of an already unfathomable chaos. The fabric of the cabin held traces of her, as evidenced by the bloodstains visible on her bedding, a chilling reminder of her disappearance into the abyss of the unknown. Bravely alongside the neighboring Seabolts, who had come at the sound of her horrific screams, Sheila entered the property to find that the three youngest children were miraculously unharmed. Rick, Greg, and their friend who had stayed the night, Justin Smart, stood as living witnesses to the horror that had unfolded around them. The three boys were discovered unscathed, their innocent slumber having shielded them from the gruesome events that had unfolded just steps away. Sheila and the Seabolts helped the three children escape through a window, shielding them from the horrors only a single doorway away. Sheila's return to Cabin 28 on that fateful morning would forever bind her to the tragedy, making her the bearer of a truth too terrifying to forget. The living room, once a place of family gatherings and shared moments, had been transformed into a heart-wrenching memorial of violence, a place forever scarred by the brutality that had taken place there. As the authorities were summoned and the investigation commenced, the town of Keddie grappled with the weight of an unsolved mystery that would weave itself into the fabric of the community's identity forever casting a shadow over the town's serenity. The Horrors of Cabin 28 Aware that time was of the essence, law enforcement mobilized swiftly and decisively. The Plumas County Sheriff's Department sprang into action, officers racing to the scene with a grim understanding of the tragedy they were about to confront. In the lead was Deputy Hank Clement, who would forever bear the weight of the indelible images he would encounter within Cabin 28. As authorities worked to understand the dynamics of this unimaginable tragedy, they grappled with a horrifying paradox. A family had been annihilated in one of the most vicious crimes ever committed in the region, while three innocent children, mere rooms away, had blissfully slept, oblivious to the carnage that had unfolded around them. Nobody anywhere had seemingly heard a thing. How could this be possible? What Deputy Clement witnessed when he entered Cabin 28 would haunt his thoughts for the rest of his life. All three victims, bound in a grotesque display of cruelty, had suffered a systematic and merciless bludgeoning, delivered with ruthless force by a claw hammer. The walls of the cabin, once witnesses to the joys of family life, now bore silent testimony to the gruesome end that had befallen its occupants. Sue Sharp had borne the brunt of this savage assault. She was found partially unclothed, a haunting indicator of the intimate and perverse nature of the crime. Her undergarments had been cruelly forced into her mouth, a grotesque gesture that only added to the macabre details of the murder. Defensive wounds marred her arms, a testament to her desperate struggle for survival in the face of unimaginable terror. Beside Sue lay her 15-year-old son, John Sharp, and his 17-year-old friend, Dana Wingate. Their young lives had been extinguished with equal brutality, their throats slashed in an act of savagery that defied all reason. Sue's fight for life had been in vain, and John and Dana had met the same gruesome fate, their bodies marked by multiple stab wounds that spoke of the sadistic frenzy that had consumed their assailants. The investigation took a grim turn as the pathologist delved deeper into the extent of the violence. Dana's autopsy revealed yet another layer of horror. He had been manually strangled, his life extinguished by the merciless grip of his attackers. In the midst of this carnage, an eerie detail emerged, a knife discarded near the lifeless bodies. Its blade, bent and twisted by the force of its use during the attack, bore silent witness to the unspeakable rage that had coursed through the cabin that night. Blood, the grim signature of violence, had painted a nightmarish tapestry throughout the cabin. It defied containment, splattering across walls, wallpaper, and ceilings, as if the very essence of the room had been tainted by the horrors that unfolded within its confines. The scene resembled a grotesque canvas with every surface marked by the crimson aftermath of brutality. As Deputy Clement stood amidst this gruesome tableau, he knew that the investigation that lay ahead would be unlike any other. The tranquil community of Keddy had been irrevocably altered, and the quest for justice would become a relentless pursuit of answers in the face of unfathomable evil. The investigation, 
One of the most haunting mysteries that surrounded the Ketty murders was the eerie silence that enveloped the brutal events of that night. Neither the young boys huddled inside the cabin nor the neighboring residents mere feet away had heard the slightest whisper of the horrors transpiring behind those closed doors. This unnatural silence, like a heavy shroud, cast a baffling enigma over the investigation, leaving seasoned investigators scratching their heads in disbelief. The disappearance of young Tina Sharp plunged the tight-knit community into a frantic search for answers. Members of the dedicated Plumas County Search and Rescue Team tirelessly scoured the picturesque Ketty area in pursuit of the missing child. Yet their efforts yielded no trace of the 12-year-old girl. Desperation drove law enforcement to issue an all-points bulletin spanning Lassen, Butte, and Sierra Counties, as well as the city of Reno. Tina's description was broadcast far and wide. A slight build adorned with long blonde hair, last seen wearing blue jeans and a matching blue shirt on the fateful night before her vanishing. As the community grappled with the shockwaves of the gruesome murders and apparent kidnapping, investigators embarked on the arduous task of reconstructing the victim's last known movements. Witnesses recalled a pivotal moment on the night of the murders when John and Dana attempted to hitch a ride near the intersection of Crescent Street and Lawrence Street in Quincy, near the Goldpan Motel. The time frame was pegged between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., shedding light on the initial leg of their ill-fated journey. However, what unfolded afterward remained shrouded in mystery. Justin Smart, a key witness and a resident of the cabin that fateful night, added layers of complexity to the investigation with his evolving accounts. Initially, he claimed to have slept through the entire ordeal, but as the investigation deepened, his recollections took erratic turns. He first insisted that he witnessed nothing, then later suggested he had seen the murders unfold from the bedroom doorway. However, his narrative veered again when he described having dreamt of the murder. Under hypnosis, Justin delved into the depths of his dreamscape, recounting vivid details. He depicted two men within the home, one characterized by a mustache and short hair, the other with longer hair and a clean-shaven visage. In his dream, the man with the mustache wielded a pocket knife in his right hand, using it to inflict harm upon Sue. In his other hand, he clutched a hammer. Another hypnosis session unveiled an unsettling image of Tina, roused from slumber and drawn to the living room by the unfolding horrors. According to Justin, a man then seized Tina in his arms, carrying her through the kitchen and out to the back steps. Moments later, the man returned alone. A psychologist scrutinized Justin's accounts, ultimately concluding that his dreams were in fact distorted reflections of the gruesome reality he had witnessed. It was a coping mechanism, a way for his mind to process the unbearable truth. In the initial weeks of the investigation, the Plumas County Sheriff's Department marshaled a team of eight investigators working tirelessly around the clock. Their efforts included launching a secret witness program to solicit leads, along with releasing sketches of two men sighted in Quincy during the week leading up to the murders. Though these individuals weren't immediately deemed suspects, their presence in the vicinity just prior to the crimes raised eyebrows. Multiple witnesses attested to their presence, but their identities remained frustratingly elusive. Over time, tips dwindled, then nearly disappeared, leaving investigators with the daunting task of responding to sporadic leads. Amid the myriad of theories that emerged, one disturbing notion lingered, the possibility that Tina had been targeted for sexual purposes. This harrowing suggestion fueled hopes that Tina might yet be found alive, held captive somewhere. Then, in April of 1984, a bottle hunter stumbled upon a grim discovery near Feather Falls, located northwest of Oroville and approximately 50 miles distant from Ketty. The human remains discovered were sent to a specialized laboratory for meticulous analysis and identification. At first, investigators had assumed that the recovered remains likely belonged to a Native American individual. However, a twist occurred when an anonymous phone call reached a sheriff's dispatcher, casting a veil of intrigue over the body. What made this call particularly uncanny was its timing, as it took place on the exact three-year anniversary of the Ketty murders, suggesting a deliberate connection. Caller, hello, I was watching the news and they were discussing the skull found at Feather Falls, seeking assistance. Dispatcher, uh-huh, caller. I couldn't help but wonder if they've considered the murder in Ketty, Plumas County a couple of years ago, where a 12-year-old girl was never found. The caller subtly implied that the uncovered remains might belong to Tina Sharp, who had been missing for a harrowing three years by then. Subsequently, through meticulous DNA analysis, it was definitively established that the recovered remains did indeed belong to Tina Sharp. Her tragic end had come sometime after November 1, 1981, a painful six months after the Ketty murders. Advanced decomposition precluded a determination of the precise cause of death. Yet the stark reality remained. Tina had met the same cruel fate as her family, another victim of this unsolved mystery.
During a thorough search of the area, investigators unearthed a blue nylon jacket, Levi jeans, and an empty medical tape dispenser, all further perplexing the case. Adding to the eerie enigma, the tape recording of this phone call was never submitted as evidence or investigated, and it would later be discovered at the bottom of a seemingly unrelated bag. The identity of the anonymous caller, along with their uncanny knowledge of Tina's remains, continues to elude discovery, haunting the investigation to this very day. Suspects begin to emerge. As the investigation unfolded, a complex web of suspects and theories began to weave its way through the dark tapestry of the Keddie murders. Witnesses, their memories etched with the chilling events of that night, recalled seeing John and Dana, two restless teenagers attempting to hitchhike along the dimly lit roads. This revelation fueled rampant speculation about the hours leading up to the merciless attack. One sinister scenario painted by investigators was that the killer or killers may have been individuals who had crossed paths with John and Dana, offering them a ride that led to a nightmarish fate. This chilling narrative suggested that these unknown assailants had forced their way into the cabin, their initial intentions concealed behind a veneer of apparent hospitality. Another theory put forward was that the killers had followed the teenagers home from the party they had been attending earlier that night. It had been claimed two men had been at the party and had exhibited very peculiar behavior. But with illicit drug use rampant at the party, witnesses were reluctant to come forward, leaving the theory stuck in the realms of speculation. Alternatively, it was proposed that John and Dana, returning home that fateful night, had inadvertently walked in on the gruesome act either targeted at Sue or to kidnap Tina, becoming accidental victims of a terror they could not have foreseen. The initial theory that the motive behind these gruesome murders was robbery was quickly dispelled. The cold, hard facts contradicted such a scenario, as nothing appeared to be missing from the cabin. This perplexing detail led investigators to an even more unsettling hypothesis, that the murders had been premeditated. This theory suggested the involvement of not one but multiple assailants, who had entered the cabin armed with deadly intent. The presence of weapons, including the claw hammer and knives, spoke volumes about the calculated malevolence that had descended upon the Sharp family. Dark rumors circulated with whispering of a cult or a drug-related gang in the murders. But these theories, initially considered by law enforcement, were swiftly abandoned as investigators uncovered no evidence to support such claims. The truth, it seemed, eluded even the most persistent of theories, leaving a gaping void in the pursuit of justice. Amidst the intricate web of suspects, two figures emerged as enduring focal points of suspicion, Martin Ray Smart and John Bobede. Remarkably, Justin, a key figure in the grim narrative, was the stepson of Martin, and their family resided in close proximity to Sue's cabin. During the era of the murders, Keddie grappled with a drug problem, with Martin allegedly playing a significant role in this troubling scenario. On the fateful night, a perplexing scene unfolded as Martin and John made an appearance at a local Keddie bar, donned in three-piece suits and sunglasses, seemingly endeavoring to attract attention to themselves. The recollections of other patrons painted a disconcerting picture, with witnesses attesting to their peculiar behavior. Was this an attempt to cement an alibi for themselves? Both Martin and John carried criminal records, and John's murky connections reached into the realm of organized crime in Chicago, adding an extra layer of complexity to their profiles. In the days leading up to her tragic demise, Sue had reportedly counseled Martin's wife Marilyn about extricating herself from an allegedly abusive marriage tainted by her husband's rumored infidelity. Ironically, speculation swirled about Sue and Martin's own rumored involvement in an affair, further muddying the waters of this perplexing case. There have even been claims that John had made several unwanted advances on Sue, all of which had been rejected. Within the labyrinthine investigation, some conjectured that Martin had become privy to the conversations between Sue and Marilyn, triggering his jealousy and possessiveness. This unsettling narrative painted a grim picture, suggesting that the intended victim that fateful night might have been Sue herself, with the others unwittingly caught in the web of violence due to their status as witnesses to the crime. Immediately following the murders, Martin drew law enforcement's scrutiny as he revealed the curious disappearance of one of his hammers before the public had even been made aware of the use of hammers in the murders. Subsequently, Martin and John absconded from Plumas County, relocating to Klamath Falls, Oregon. After the disintegration of his marriage, Martin embarked on a journey that led him to Reno, Nevada, where he sought solace and guidance from a counselor. It was in this delicate setting that a revelation surfaced when the counselor made a startling claim. Martin had purportedly confessed to the murders of both Sue and Tina. In this sinister revelation, Martin purportedly admitted responsibility for the murders of Sue and Tina, stating, 
I killed the woman and the daughter, but I didn't have anything to do with the boys, as the counselor probed deeper into this harrowing confession. An even darker narrative unfolded. Martin, it was claimed, described his actions with a chilling composure. He allegedly stated that he had incapacitated Tina, casting a ghastly pall over the circumstances, and then felt compelled to extinguish her life, all because she had become an inadvertent witness to his malevolent deeds. Beneath this confession lay a haunting motive, according to the counselor's account. Martin apparently harbored a belief that Sue bore responsibility for instigating Marilyn's desire for divorce, thus catalyzing a chain of events that culminated in a brutal tragedy. The Department of Justice, however, swiftly dismissed this revelation, categorizing it as hearsay, and opted not to investigate it any further. Among the pieces of evidence that captured attention during this disconcerting chapter was a letter authored by Martin, addressed to Marilyn. Within the letter, a single line stood out like a dark omen. I've paid the price of your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you tell me we are through. Taken in isolation, this sentence bore an incriminating weight and has frequently been used as evidence for Martin's involvement. Yet when examined within the broader context of the three-page letter, a different interpretation begins to emerge. It seemed that Martin may not have been alluding to acts of violence, but rather expressing profound regret for sacrificing precious time with his own four children. Stemming from a previous marriage, in his relentless pursuit of a life intertwined with Marilyn and her children, neither Martin nor John were ever charged in relation to the crime, and both men have since passed away. In a shocking twist, in 1996, the spotlight shifted to Robert Joseph Silveria Jr. as a potential suspect. Silveria had once called Plumas County home in the mid-1980s, known for his courteous demeanor and a penchant for adorning envelopes with intricate drawings during his tenure as a county employee. However, the startling twist in Silveria's narrative emerged when he was apprehended in 1996, becoming a suspected figure in no fewer than 17 murders. His dark odyssey spanned 15 years as he traversed the United States often riding the railroads and leaving death in his wake among fellow drifters he encountered. Upon his arrest, Silveria astonishingly confessed to a staggering 28 murders, a list that included the Ketty murders. Nonetheless, the wheels of justice would ultimately find him culpable for just two of these heinous crimes. Intriguingly, it later came to light that Silveria had been in custody at the time of the Ketty cabin murders for Grand Theft Auto, meaning he could not have played a role in them, as he had claimed. The investigation reopens. The year was 2013, and Greg Hagwood, embarking on his third year as the county sheriff, faced an array of pressing challenges within his department and across the county. Budget constraints and staffing shortages weighed heavily on his shoulders. But amidst these concerns, one unsolved case continued to haunt him, the Ketty murders. These were no ordinary victims. These were people he had grown up with, boys he had known personally. He shared a connection with Cabin 28 and Ketty, having spent nights there in his younger years with friends and their families. Hagwood's journey into law enforcement had begun with a degree in criminal justice from California State University, Sacramento. He became a deputy in his hometown in 1988. While the Ketty murders remained an open case, it hadn't been a top priority for the department. Yet the Ketty murders had etched themselves into local folklore as one of the county's most notorious unsolved crimes. Combined with his personal connections to the victims, Hagwood felt compelled to breathe new life into the investigation. It was during this time that he approached Mike Gamberg, a seasoned private investigator, to take the reins of the case. Gamberg wasn't a stranger to the victims either. He had coached the two boys in martial arts and other activities, and Dana Wingate had even visited his house just a day before his tragic death. Gamberg accepted the challenge, driven by strong convictions about both what had and hadn't transpired 32 years earlier. When Gamberg first delved into the Ketty murders, he encountered a room filled with remnants of the crime scene. A daunting sight. Box after box of evidence. File drawers stuffed with information and other items lay in disarray. A testament to the passage of time and the convoluted history of the investigation. One particularly vexing aspect was the absence of the original case history log, detailing the who, what, and when of the initial investigation, a void that continued to perplex Gamberg. Physical evidence retrieved from Cabin 28, including blood-marked items like the living room carpet and wallboard, lay dormant in storage, further complicated by disorganization. As Gamberg sifted through the labyrinthine puzzle, he stumbled upon an unopened bag of evidence, a critical piece that had never been entered into the official record, an omission with far-reaching implications for a thorough criminal investigation. But the most intriguing discovery was yet to come. Inside an envelope lay the tape recording of the anonymous caller reporting a potentially chilling connection to the Ketty case. This call, received after the discovery of human remains near Feather Falls, 
hinted at an eerie familiarity with Tina Sharp's disappearance, suggesting that the caller possessed intimate knowledge of the events. Gamberg was determined to unravel the mystery surrounding this anonymous caller. He initiated the painstaking process of comparing the male voice on the tape with the voices of potential or known suspects. Yet scientific analysis moved at a slow pace, and the case's vintage meant it didn't receive the same urgency as recent crimes. Gamberg began to suspect that the tape had been deliberately overlooked during its time at the Plumas County Sheriff's Office. While not typically inclined toward conspiracy theories, even Hagwood couldn't ignore the facts and circumstances that raised troubling questions. Although two of the prime suspects, Martin and John, had passed away, they had been alive at the time of Tina Sharp's discovery. With these revelations in mind, Gamberg relentlessly pursued the case, following leads and evidence that had been overlooked for 37 years. Gamberg's seasoned expertise in homicide cases had prepared him for this moment. Having worked on nearly all of Plumas County's homicide cases from 1974 to his retirement in 1994, he was well acquainted with the intricacies of criminal investigations. Strikingly, the Ketty murder case had been the one that got away, eluding his involvement. Within three years of reopening the case, Gamberg began sharing new evidence, most notably a hammer matching the one Martin had claimed was missing before the murders, and a hunting knife discovered in Ketty. He also located the driver who had picked up John and Dana on the night of the murders, interviewing her. The California Department of Justice played a pivotal role in the case, and its actions have been a source of particular concern for Gamberg and Hagwood. They believe that the DOJ's initial involvement was followed by a lack of follow-through, resulting in a major gap in the investigation's progress. According to Gamberg, immediately following the murders, Sheriff Doug Thomas reached out to the DOJ in Sacramento for assistance. Surprisingly, the DOJ dispatched two individuals, Special Agents Harry Bradley and P.A. Krim from their organized crime unit rather than their homicide division to investigate. This decision seems extremely unusual and suspicious, and Gamberg suggests it might be related to one of the suspects, John Bubade, who had connections with organized crime in Chicago and used multiple aliases. John's connection to organized crime appears to have attracted the DOJ's interest. Gamberg has speculated that the DOJ might have protected him for some undisclosed reason. Fast forward to April 2018 and a remarkable breakthrough surfaced. Gamberg disclosed that DNA evidence retrieved from a fragment of tape found at the crime scene had been successfully matched to a known living suspect, marking a pivotal turn in the investigation. However, there have been no further updates on the case since this revelation five years ago, and who this DNA belongs to has not been publicly announced. Despite this, both investigators have stated on the record that they believe Martin and John to be responsible for the murders, and that there are two living individuals who were accessories after the fact that are known to them. Due to the lack of progress or announcements after this supposed DNA discovery, it is unclear what really has or has not been discovered in the new investigation, and the case still remains shrouded in mystery. Conclusion The Ketty murders remain one of the most haunting and perplexing unsolved mysteries in the annals of American crime. The brutal slaying of Sue, John and Dana, and the disappearance and later discovery of Tina sent shockwaves through the quiet community of Ketty, California in 1981. Over the decades, the case has seen its share of twists and turns, missteps, and potential cover-ups. Investigators, both past and present, have grappled with the challenges posed by missing evidence, compromised crime scenes, and a changing landscape of forensic science. Recent efforts to revisit the case by Special Investigator Mike Gamberg and former Plumas County Sheriff Greg Hagwood have shed new light on old leads. Discoveries of evidence such as a hammer matching one described by a suspect and potential DNA matches have rekindled hopes of solving the case. The persistence of Gamberg, Hagwood, and their team in the face of daunting obstacles is a testament to their dedication to bringing closure to the victims' families and the community that has lived under the shadow of this tragedy for over four decades. While the Ketty murders remain unsolved to this day, the commitment of those involved in the investigation serves as a beacon of hope that one day justice will prevail. The memories of Sue, John, Dana, and Tina will continue to live on and their story will serve as a reminder that the pursuit of truth and justice never truly ends. If you're still watching, thank you so much for sticking with me until the end. If you enjoyed this deep dive into this unsettling cold case, please like and subscribe, and check out some of my other true crime videos on the channel, some of which are on screen right now. I really appreciate your support and hope you found this video interesting. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.